Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Autumn Senior Fellow Society webinar. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, uh, Sarah Lowry. Now, many of you will know that under the auspices of the Lives of the Fellow Committee, we have been developing an oral history, an account of surgery in the 20th and 21st century. And Sarah, as a professional oral historian, has been key in this initiative. She and I worked together and interviewed several of the distinguished surgeons, which I'm sure she will be telling you about very shortly. Sarah has worked in oral history for the past 18 years. She managed the Refugee Communities History Project, supporting field workers to record 160 interviews in 19 different languages, which are now archived uh, in the Museum of London. Following this, she worked at the Foundling Museum, where she helped to record the memories of men and women who grew up in the Foundling Hospital School in the first half of the 20th century. Sarah also works as the Oral History Officer at the Royal College of Physicians. Today, she's going to tell us about oral history in general and how the surgical project is developing. Uh, now, can I remind fellows to uh, place any questions on the chat line, and I will read them out to Sarah at the end of the talk. Also, please note that the talk will be recorded. So, Sarah, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Irving. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, Due to some technical issues with the um, platform, we've actually had to pre-record the, the talk for this evening. Um, so I, I really hope it, it comes out okay. It's a rather strange experience recording a talk in advance because you don't get that adrenaline rush that maybe you get when you when you do it live. Um, obviously, I will be here to answer questions afterwards um, if there's anything that's a bit unclear in the talk. Um, but thank you very much indeed for, for coming along and I, I really hope you enjoy it. Hello everybody, thank you very much indeed for coming along to this talk on oral history. Um, my name is Sarah Lowry. We'll be looking at various different things today. Um, one is a very brief history of oral history um, and its fall from favour and its renaissance in the 19th and 20th centuries in the UK. We'll also very briefly look at some of the oral history collections that are available that deal with um, medicine and health. Um, we'll be thinking about oral history as a historical source, some of the things it's good on, some of the things it's perhaps a little less good on, and um, then finally some of the ways in which people use their oral history collections. I think the talk will last between 30 and 40 minutes, and obviously there will be time for, for questions at the end. So I don't think anyone would deny that oral history is the first kind of history. Since we've been on this, the planet, we've had this inherent need to pass information down from generation to generation. And a long time before people were reading or writing, they would talk to each other and tell each other stories. And there are some really famous works, such as the Bible or epic poetry, which um, we now think of, obviously, as, as text, as written texts, but they were preserved by word of mouth for a long time before they were written down. And epic poetry, for example, is a, an interesting example um, because lots of different versions of, say, the Odyssey or the Iliad survive. And that is because people remembered it in different ways. And that's that's very true of the, the oral history we collect today as well. Often accounts conflict or they're different. Um, and then we need to think about by, why that's the case. The first historians, um, going on for a long time, did use oral sources, um, but very gradually it started to fall from favour as printing um, came into being and people were just generating more and more written texts. Historians tended to turn to those because they didn't change. Um, and by the 18th century, Voltaire said that oral tradition loses a degree of probability at each successive transmission. So really historians began to doubt how people's memories worked and the um, 
the truth, whether people were telling the truth and whether they remembered things correctly. And this made historians stop using oral history so consistently as a, as a useful historical source. But it did have a, a renaissance in the 19th and 20th centuries in the UK. And a lot of that was grounded in the work of some of the social reformers, such as Charles Booth or Beatrice Webb. Um, they would go into people's homes and literally talk to them about, you know, how do you live? What are your working conditions like? What do you do in your spare time? Very common oral history questions to ask now. Um, of course, at this point, they, they wouldn't be recorded. They would write down the responses and generated some incredibly important and useful historical sources, which are, are heavily used today. But for oral history, the, the big change came really when Thomas Edison, and I know that's disputed, <laughs> created a way to record sound. So the fact that you could go to someone, you could speak to them, you could say, what's your experience of this or that? And you could fix their answer in time, the same way that you could fix a written source in time. And that made a massive difference. The oldest recordings are not that good in terms of sound quality. Um, I think the first recording was made in um, 1877. This first clip that I'm going to play you is with Florence Nightingale, was recorded in 1890. So obviously this clip is 130 years old, um, but I think you'd agree that it would be pretty much unusable. You know, it's very difficult to, to make out what Florence Nightingale is saying. Um, obviously sound quality did improve very quickly in recordings um, and oral history became a very viable way of, um, of collecting, oh, I'm sorry, uh, recordings became a very viable way of collecting people's stories and starting to preserve them in archives. This recording is from the 1930s, um, and it's of somebody who witnessed the sinking of the Titanic. Next thing I remember, I was still hanging on to a bit of rope attached to the raft, but some 30 or 40 yards away from the ship. The wash of the falling funnel had evidently picked us up, raft and all, and flung us clear of the ship altogether. Several of us scrambled up onto the slippery bottom of the raft, and it was from there I saw the Titanic sink. Sorry, I'll just go back. So you can hear that the um, sound quality there is enormously better. Um, but something else you probably noticed is that this narrator is reading a previously prepared script um, which is quite interesting. He obviously wants the, the part to be perfect, um, but you do lose a lot of the spontaneity that you get um, when you do a regular interview and people talk sort of more off the cuff. Um, so oral history isn't meant to be perfect. You know, it's not meant to be people speaking beautifully, eloquent, eloquently and perfectly. Um, it's meant to be spontaneous and from the heart and a little bit messy. Um, so, so this written um, and reading out version isn't what we want at all. So going backwards and forwards. Um, this slide just gives a little display of how sound formats have changed through time. Um, and I think it's quite interesting. It's from the Design Museum in Holland Park, which is quite interesting to think about how the way we access sound has changed so incredibly, you know, in my lifetime. So on the very far left, as you look at the slide, you can see um, a wax cylinder. So that Florence Nightingale recording that I played for you was done on, on wax cylinder. Then next is reel to reel. So a lot of the really early BBC recordings are done on, on reel to reel. The sound quality is much better 
actually. Then vinyl, you know, when I was a kid, we would go and buy our vinyl um, records with our pocket money. Um, and then very quick change, vinyl to tape to CD, um, everyone having to replace their music collections and, and getting cross about it. And now, of course, we have no tangible way in which we access sound at all. You know, it's almost all through computers, MP3 streaming. Um, so it's changed incredibly quickly. Um, and there's been some concern about that actually in the oral history world. And there's been a big push over the last 10 years or so to digitize analog collections. Because if you have a collection, say on tape, for example, not only does the tape degrade, um, but um, I don't know when the last time you saw a tape recorder was, but the, the machines that we used to play the sound back just don't exist anymore and can't be repaired if they do exist. So um, there has been this big push to, to digitise those collections over the last few years. And oral history is, is very buoyant, actually, in the UK at the moment. So part of the reason that I'm doing this talk is because we're doing a pilot project at the moment at the Royal College of Surgeons, um, just starting to record some, some people's experiences. Um, but there's a lot of recording work going on. Um, and I just wanted to make you aware of a, a few collections and um, projects that, that might be of interest. So these are, these are all ones with a, a medical a medical event. So the, the British Library is the biggest repository of oral histories in the United Kingdom. Um, and they have a big collection of oral histories of health and medicine, many of which would be available online, or obviously you can go into the library and access them there. In, I think it was, yes, it was 19, uh, sorry, 2017, 1917, 2017, that Manchester University started a very big oral history project um, looking at the history of the National Health Service to, to mark its 70th anniversary. Um, and they did literally hundreds and hundreds of recordings, mainly working through volunteers, not just with physicians and surgeons and nurses, but also you know people working in, in kitchens and porters and all the people that, that have contributed hugely to, to running the National Health Service. Um, and again, that collection is available both at Manchester and in the British Library. Um, the anaesthetists have a big oral history collection. Um, I know they're a group that work incredibly closely with the surgeons, so that might be of interest to you. To you. Um, talking, um, lots of people talking about how the field has changed enormously during their careers. The Royal College of Nursing also has a big oral history collection. Um, it's not online, unfortunately, so you would need to go in and access it both at um, in London and in Edinburgh. But it's not just big institutions like, you know, the Royal Colleges and the British Library that do oral history recording. There's a huge amount of community based oral history work that goes on as well. And this is a, a project that I've been quite involved in over the years, um, where people who came from the Caribbean to nurse in the 1950s and 60s and 70s have um, been recording their own experiences um, and archiving that material for future generations. One of the, I, I work freelance um, and I also work at the Royal College of Physicians part time where I'm their sort of in house oral historian. Um, there are two big oral collection, oral history collections at the Royal College of Physicians. One which is video interviews. So obviously you can do either video or audio. Um, I do encourage people to think of oral history as sound source. I think so much is conveyed in the way that people speak in oral history that it's important to think about it in that way. Um, but you can obviously do either video or audio. Um, so there's a big video collection at the Physicians that dates back to the 1980s and was recorded in partnership with Oxford Brookes University. Um, and then there's a, another collection called Voices of Medicine, which I've been working on since 2015 with some really fantastic volunteers, most of whom are retired physicians themselves. Um, just again, collecting physicians' experiences mainly of the changes in hospital medicine since the Second World War. That's particularly what we've been focusing on in the, the 2015 collection. Um, I'm just going to play you a quick clip from Voices of Medicine. This is with a, a physician and neurologist called Linda Luxon, who, who some of you might know, used to work at um, 
in Queen Square. Just thinking about some of the working practices and how they've changed. He was very over much the old school. I remember when I started, he said, I remember I feel so sorry for you. When I was a doctor, we didn't have those wretched things that go bleep, bleep, bleep all the time. He said, when sister used to come and get me in the middle of the night because Mrs. Smith wasn't very well, she would bring me a cup of tea and say, Mrs. Smith isn't very well, I'd like you to come and see her. And by the time I'd had my cup of tea and got up and got dressed, Mrs. Smith was either dead or better. <laughs> He would have been a junior doctor, I guess, I suppose in the early 30s. He would have been, and I guess there wasn't very much you could do in the early 30s, so perhaps it wasn't such a silly approach to things. Gosh, it would be so unlike that now. You'd be there in point one of a millisecond if you could be. So yes, Linda Luxon talking about um, changes in working practices during her career. Um, obviously, we do collect a lot of sound in oral history projects, but we do also like to collect um, photographs um, and documents to go alongside the, the sound. Um, so this is a photograph of the shop um, that the parents of John Bennett um, owned, again, I think in the 1940s and 50s on the Wirral. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's really nice. He became a, a gastroenterologist, but um, here it, he was, he, we have in his oral history recording him talking about his, his parents' um, pharmacy as well. So that was a physician talking about changes in, in working practices. I would now like to play you a clip where um, some people that you will know, I think, will be talking about a change in, in the working practices of surgeons during their during their careers. So the first person is, is Harold Ellis and the second is Avril Mansfield. And many thanks to both of them for giving an interview for the pilot project. I mean, nobody in, in, in my long lifetime of a practice would have said to me, Harold, knocking off time, cancel the last, if a, if a Sniffling little administrator had come into my theatre and said, "You've got to stop now, doc, because like it goes over the time now." <laughs> I'd kick him. I'd, I mean, I'd probably be struck off the register. I said, "I couldn't, I couldn't tolerate it." I said, "You go and tell this patient he's been waiting all day for his operation. You, you tell him that you're stopping me from doing his operation now. I defy you." We would start probably not much before nine o'clock. It was, wasn't a crack of dawn start, but there was no end to it. Whatever was on that list and needed to be done would be done. And I can remember the day, I remember the shock that I felt when somebody came up to me and said, you can't do the last case on your list. Why not was the, was, you know, why not? <laughs> because we haven't got any staff to, that will stay to, you know, into the evening to do it. Um, and, and you've had a, you know, nine hours of operating already. And, uh, and I, I was so shocked that anybody would think we could cancel a patient who was ready and waiting for theatre and starved and, and frightened. And, but, you know, it was, it was in a massive change that occurred when suddenly we weren't allowed to go on all the hours that God sent. I mean, some of the older surgeons would operate into the night if that was what they felt was needed just to finish the operating list. We would start, we would start probably not I much mean, before nine o'clock. It oh, wasn't a crack of dawn start, but there was no end to it. Whatever was on that list and needed to be done would be done. And I can remember. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't work out how to stop that clip. Um, but you can hear Harold and Avril um, saying very similar things about their reaction to being told that, um, you know, they could no longer just work to the end of the day and finish, finish their list. Um, oral histories are quite often recorded to fill gaps in archives. So sometimes oral histories can capture information that it's actually impossible to to collect by other means um and and surgeons reactions to being told um you know you can't you can't keep operating today um is perhaps one of those things that you know is is quite difficult to to um capture by other means i mean no. 
it's not just um, how people worked, of course, it's, it's what people did. Um, and oral histories can obviously be one of the ways and you can capture some of these huge changes and developments that happened both in surgery and medicine um, during the 20th century. Um, so this gentleman, Norman Jones, um, is a, a physician in renal medicine talking about um, dialysis and how when he first started in medicine, you, you just couldn't save people if they had renal failure, they would die. Um, even if it, you know, it was probably quite a short term thing, it, it still wouldn't be possible to, to save those people. Um, and then talking about how dialysis came in, but particularly the emotions, I think oral history is very strong on emotions, the way people felt about things and, and listening to the, the joy that he felt um, when suddenly he was able to, to save people who previously couldn't have been saved. It's extremely moving, I think. It was easy to be blinkered in nephrology because, I mean, when I was a junior doctor, certainly as a student and junior doctor, uh, kidney failure was just death, uh, there was nothing else. And this revolutionized that. By the time it came that we could move into the new unit, we had seven people on regular dialysis going through that um, pretty well non-stop little unit but when we had our 21st birthday party as a renal unit five of those seven were there 21 years later that i think is one of my happiest memories so i love the the emotion in norman james's voice at, at the end of that clip and just again how you can capture this moment through oral history that perhaps you can't capture through other means it was easy um again i showed you the the picture of john bennett's um shop um or his parents shop um this is miles irving's um contract when he had his very first house i think it's house physician yes house physician's job um, from 1956. And again, lots of people in oral histories in, in medicine and surgery will talk about how incredibly hard they worked as, as juniors, particularly as, as house physicians or house surgeons. Um, and it's very brilliant when people have kept things like this contract, which says I'm being paid £486 per year, but 125 will be taken off for furnished room, board and laundry. Um, and again, just capturing a time that's passed now, you know, juniors don't live in hospitals anymore. Um, and obviously the pay scales change completely. Um, but, um, you know, brilliant when people keep these things and, and we're able to, to preserve them in the archives along with the stories. Um, also a clip where Professor Irving uh, Sir Miles, sorry, is talking about um, working conditions and just some of the inequalities. We've been talking quite a lot about inequalities um, based around COVID, but here talking about some of the inequalities in the NHS when he started working in um, at Hope Hospital in Salford, just comparing that experience with some of the resources they'd had um, and in some of the teaching hospitals in London where he'd worked as a junior. My uh, next teaching hospital north from Manchester was Glasgow. The next teaching hospital south was Birmingham. It was a huge drainage area. I mean, the, the extent of neglected disease in Salford was just amazing. I mean, my jaw dropped at some of the stuff I saw. When it came to the clinics, we were in the old hospital and it was just an old outpatient with a few cubicles. And I remember uh, there was a patient with a, a bleeding from the rectum. Now, in those days, they would be brought in and given a general anaesthetic. And that was totally unnecessary. And I said uh, uh, to the sister, I would like to uh, sigmoidoscope this patient. Now, at Bart, uh, there'd be about six to eight sigmoidoscopes uh, available. And she said, well, uh, with surprise, you'll have to wait until we get it from the operating theatre. And I said, it? She said, yes, there's one there. Anyway, I waited and it came down. 
and then I bent down to sigmoidoscope the patient, so the patient was in the left lateral, and um, I popped the sigmoidoscope in and then leant forward to look and discovered that my head was on one wall and my backside was on the other, and I couldn't really get my head down low enough to see up the sigmoidoscope. I just unbelievable. Uh, a cause for great laughter in the end. So oral histories can be very funny, um, but often the humour does um, bring out a much more serious um, side of information about inequalities or lack of equipment, or also motivations of people for doing things, um, which again, difficult to capture in other ways perhaps. So lots of people talking about why they started studying medicine in the first place, and then making the decision between being a physician or a surgeon. It's interesting for the last seven years, I've heard people say why they decided to become a physician. Now it's very interesting to start hearing people saying why they decided to become a surgeon. Um, but yes, it's humour, but humour making us laugh, but also bringing out an important point. Man. Um, in the Physicians project that we've been working on, um, a lot of people talk about the ethics side, um, the introduction of ethics committees, a lot about Morris Papworth, um, a lot about how things changed. Um, this is Robin Ferner um, talking about taking part in trials. So it seemed very common that physicians would take part in each other's trials. <clears throat> um, and he's he's talking about his experience of that, which, which didn't go very well. But on this particular occasion, I was basically getting the saline control, I think. And it is said that my last words were, Christ, that isn't bloody saline. And I then had a cardiac arrest and was resuscitated mercifully by two other registrars and admitted to the coronary cane. And I had quite a period of unconsciousness. And then I woke or became dimly aware of various things. One was a monitor in atrial fibrillation. And another was people coming to see me. And there was my twin brother, which, since he lived 200 miles away, seemed a bit odd. And gradually it emerged that I'd had some sort of event, probably related to the injection. But since then I've not allowed myself to be an experimental subject. And I've been, how can I put it, reluctant to make others experimental subjects. So again, in a way, quite a funny story, but not really funny at all when you um, think about it carefully. Um, <clears throat> and personal experiences. So oral history is an extremely personal source. It's very subjective. Um, it's obviously not a source that you can use in isolation. You need to use it alongside other historical sources when you're doing research and compiling material for a book or a publication. Um, but it does bring out this very personal side. Um, and again, you sort of thinking on a, a very individual level, perhaps, about why things started to change. Um, sorry, this is not a very good picture, <laughs> but um, again, some of you, you may recognise this, this person, um, as Sheila Sherlock, um, again, involved in, in liver medicine, um, an incredibly important person for the Royal College of Physicians. Um, so it, it, uh, other changes that are charted, obviously through lots of means, but also through oral history might be um, changes in the workforce and particularly the role of women in medicine in this particular case. Um, and people talking about the perhaps challenges or not <laughs> um, of being a woman in medicine um, here in the, I think she was talking about sort of 1940s, 50s, 60s. I imagine that um your sex has never been a handicap to you in your medical career, have not, you? Not really. I'm, feminists would like to say it has, uh, that you know, but I, I really don't think so. Okay. I can think of a few things that uh, I would like to have been that uh, I wasn't, I think, because of my sex. You ran for presidency of the college and you came close to, to election. Um, mm. 
Do you think that that was, in, in any sense, still a discrimination? Probably. I think it's. Probably. I think there's still but, a slight. Uh, I wouldn't be. Uh, mm. I'm not worried that I didn't get it because mm. I think I had more interesting things to do. I think it's a disgrace that a club like the Athenaeum doesn't yes. let women in. Mm, mm. And my husband's a member of the Athenaeum. He attended the meeting when the thought of ladies being admitted. And you should have seen those old fuddy duddies getting up, including members of our profession. Yes. Saying, well, that's what, what that I think I, I mean, is this a, sort of thing is ridiculous. Yes. But um, I think a lot of the trouble in, with women in, is that they really don't give their mind to it as much as they should. And they perhaps don't have such a good husband as I have. Very interesting clip, this. Um, and, you know, obviously sometimes people say things that, that perhaps we don't agree with um, in oral history, and that's completely fine. It's an opportunity for them to say what they think. Um, and whether we all agree or not is, is immaterial. We record that information for the archives, and it gives a cross-section of different views and different opinions at different times, um, which is incredibly important. And also here, you know, bringing out that political side of the Royal Colleges as well, especially when connected with um, elections of presidents, for example, which can also be, be very interesting. Um, and just a final clip. Um, so more recently at the RCP, been interviewing people who um, who've been working through the COVID pandemic. Um, and again, as you would imagine, um, just bringing out those individual, often deeply emotional responses, um, which are of enormous value to the archives. Obviously, you can go to other records to find out exactly how many people died on particular days or um, you know, more about the government response. But in terms of an individual physician's personal emotional response to working through this period, oral history would be very strong indeed in, in recording that kind of information. So this um, lady with the, with the mask is, her name is Catherine Monaghan, and she's talking about one of the patients that she treated at the very start of the pandemic, so March 2020. Get it to play. And we'd gone in to see this lady on the ward round, and she was absolutely terrified. She didn't have any of her family there, and she saw us in all of this gear. And she thought she was in the Second World War because obviously she'd lived through that. So she started crying and she's saying, oh, why, why have you all got gas masks on? And I was trying to explain to her, they're not gas masks, honey, they're not gas masks. It's just to protect us from, from the virus and from the germ. And then one of my colleagues said, oh, we're in fancy dress. And she said, you're in fancy dress. And I went, yes, we are, my darling. We're having a fancy dress party. And she was like, oh, that's so lovely. That's so exciting. And she calmed right down after that. And it felt like so, such a lot, like, a nice little glimmer of hope and then we went outside and we were crying for about 10 minutes just thinking this is this is awful this is not how we deal with our patients this is not the level of communication that we want you want to be able to sit and hold the hands of these frightened people i think that was really one of my worst memories of the situation just how scared she was but the best as well because it just brings out the kindness in your colleagues so again i think a, a very moving story um and obviously people very often have these very vivid memories of particular patients and particular incidents that happened um and you know oral history it, they've been captured through oral history which i'm hoping will be really valuable um information for the royal college of physicians to have in its archives in in the future So in terms of um, using oral histories, we, we tend to do it for the long, with the long view, to be honest. It's it, when we record and put into archives, we're thinking about the future. We're thinking about researchers who might use this material. Um, and from that point of view, we're trying to make the content um, 
as useful as it can be, obviously, and we're trying to make the sound as good as it can be. Um, so we can't, we don't just use it for our own projects and work and exhibitions, but, but thinking about it being useful for people in the future. So at the Physicians, we have made the material available where people have agreed to that through the um, library catalogue online so people can listen to the sound um, and see the associated written documents um, on the internet so here you can see a, a slide with with the names of the people that some of the people because obviously not everybody gives permission for their material to go online but some of the people that we've interviewed um, where you can access their recordings um, and here you can see the record if you click on one of the names this is this is what you you get and you can you can download the audio and listen to that um, and you can also see a detailed summary that gives you information about what in this case professor london's talking about at different points in the interview um obviously you do use for publicity purposes as well um so here you can see that um I've edited little sections from the interview. So the interviews themselves would be quite long. They might be three to four hours long. Of course, oral history interviews don't have to be that long. Um, they can be significantly shorter. Um, but most of the ones in the physician's collection are about three to four hours long. Um, so people, not many people would want to, to listen to the whole thing, but you can listen to little clips of the kinds that I've just been playing to you now. Um, and you can do that on the website. We also use the material to write blogs um, and certainly in the same vein, you could use it to do podcasts, it's not something I've actually done. Um, but here I've written a piece on um, what the oral histories can tell us about the changes in doctor patient communication over the time period that they cover. Um, and we also use the clips sometimes um, in monks' role entries. I think your your comparison is Pa's lives, isn't it? Um, so here's Charles Fletcher, um, who you probably know is, is the first person ever to administer penicillin to to a patient in the world. Um, and um, in his oral history from the 1980s, he talks about that experience and he talks about the exact patient that they they treated a policeman who who got an infection from a just from a prick on his finger, I think, from a rose thorn, um, talking about treating that patient. And we've built that into um, his written obituary. People use um, oral histories for audio trails. It's not something we've done at the Royal College of Physicians, um, but um, lots of projects, particularly ones around the built environment, would use oral histories um, to illustrate historical walks, for example. Um, so this is one in Hackney. Um, it's full of really talented journalists, Hackney, um, and they did a, an oral history project and then did a very clever system where they use the GPS system on your mobile phone. Um, they map out a route, and as you walk around the route, the um, GPS kicks in the sound at particular points, and you just literally hear it um, through your headphones as you're walking around the route, and it will tell you about specific places and, and people's memories connected with those. It's quite expensive to do that, but very interesting. And then, of course, you can use oral histories in your exhibition and at the Surgeons, you've got this fantastic opportunity with your, your wonderful new building and your new museum opening to, to build sound into that. Um, so this is, again, the Royal College of Physicians. You can see in this picture somebody listening to sound connected with, with one of the exhibitions we held there. Just a, another, another example from the Physicians of somebody accessing sound through through an exhibition. Um, another project that I worked on, which I, I haven't talked about because it was focusing this talk mainly on medicine, is um, at the, the founding museum in Bloomsbury. We interviewed people who'd grown up in the care of the founding hospital school in the first half of the, the 20th century. Um, and this is the exhibition we held there. Um, 
using the research that we collected through that project, where you can attach sounds and stories to um, objects that you've collected. Um, so here you would put a, a speaker to your ear and you'd be able to hear sound clips associated with those objects. So that's the end of the talk. Um, I'm sorry, it's, I feel like it's not been very professional. I've struggled a little bit with the, um, with the presentation and just starting and stopping the sounds. But um, obviously, I will now be available to, to answer questions. So any questions you have in connection with, with what I've been talking about, I would be very happy to hear. And this is my email address if you want to, to get in touch. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, um, maybe just just before you you come back in, Irving, I, I realise I didn't say very much about the other people who are involved with the project at the Surgeons, um, which I would like to do. So it's being led by by Susan Isaacs um, in the Library Service, which is it has been brilliant um and then we've interviewed six people um two of which irving and i have interviewed well three in fact <laughs> which irving and i have interviewed together um and then andrew sadler and um, neil weir have also done interviews which has been really good because it's it's a very good idea i think to to compare the interviews you get when surgeons interview other surgeons compared to when an oral historian interviews a surgeon it's quite a different dynamic um and then john black has also been providing a lot of um, help with the project. So big thank you to all those people. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so I'm just having difficulty with my screen at the moment, but um, hopefully you can hear me. Thank you very much. That that really was a superb account of oral history, and we're most grateful to you, and for, certainly for all the work that you're doing, uh, looking at uh, the oral history of surgeons through the, the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, we have uh, time for some questions, and so please uh, put on the chat line uh, any questions. But Ed, if Ed, if you're there, for some reason I having difficulty finding my chat line. It seems to have disappeared from my screen. Um, are you there, Ed? Hi, the, hi, Irving. Yeah. Um, Irving, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you yeah. will see like a blue um, flower type of icon. The, got it. It's just yeah. here. Thank you very much. That's Thank you. Um, so please, uh, any questions to Sarah? I should explain about the technical problems that we had. Unfortunately, uh, the platform Go to, which is a platform the college uses for its webinars, uh, unfortunately uh, doesn't accept audios. Um, and obviously, this talk uh, depended very much on having audio. So, uh, Sarah very kindly pre recorded her talk. Um, and I hope, uh, I don't think it detracted at all uh, from the content. Um, so, Please, uh, any questions to Sarah related to oral history in, in general, uh, and particularly uh, any surgical problems? Let me just have a look here. Okay, this is a question from Jonathan Davis. Is there any, any evidence that oral history is therapeutic uh, for the interviewee in having people bear witness to our experiences in the NHS stroke surgery, thinking especially about PTSD and COVID. Um, yes, I think that's a really good question. Um, I'm not aware of any research that definitively says that it is therapeutic, but um, just in terms of 
anecdotal evidence. Um, certainly a lot of people do say that um, giving an interview is quite therapeutic and actually that experience of being listened to without somebody coming in all the time or sort of waiting for their turn to speak but just listening, listening, listening um, I think has been quite therapeutic for people. Um, obviously a, a tiny drop in the ocean compared to what people have gone through when they've been working through the COVID pandemic um, but I think generally it is I hope a positive experience for um, the people, the people that take part. Yes, I'm sure it did. Um, while we're waiting for other questions, Sarah, I, I just got a couple of points, perhaps you could clarify, and that are the legal implications of oral history. In other words, consent, uh, recordings, and their use. Would you like to perhaps uh, give some overview on the uh, legal um, and ethical implications relating to taking oral histories? Uh, yes, of course. It's, it's not my area of expertise, um, but certainly for the Royal College of Surgeons, there are various things we're doing to comply with the legal side. Um, so Sue has drawn up um, forms that people need to sign. So when somebody agrees to give an interview, um, we do ask them to sign beforehand just to say that they definitely are happy to take part and also to allow the college to keep people's details for longer than they might otherwise be allowed to keep them because of GDPR. Um, I mean, technically, because you're a membership organisation and you probably have those details anyway, um, it's not as um, vital as that is for other projects, but it's it's a you know, really good thing to do. And then after somebody has done their interview, what we do is we ask them to sign a form transferring their copyright in that recording to the college. Um, so in an oral history recording, there are two copyrights, it's a bit like a piece of music. Um, there'd be a copyright in the recording itself, which the college would automatically own. Um, as the organisation doing the project, but the interviewee owns the copyright in their own words, and that's what we ask people to sign across. If people aren't keen on doing that, then um, you can also license the college to use the material for certain purposes. And also individuals, of course, um, have the opportunity of hearing uh, the version and can edit it or redact parts which he or she is unhappy with. Yes, that's absolutely right. So um, I think the last question was about oral history and, and therapy, and I think there's quite a lot of crossover between oral history and therapy and, and the sort of ways that, that therapists communicate with their with their clients. Um, there's less overlap between oral history and journalism, I think. Um, so sometimes journalists are accused of trying to trick their their interviewees or, or take a line on something, but oral history is not about that at all. Oral history is about trying to create an atmosphere where people can really say what they want. Um, and then we do send a copy of the recording to people and they can review that and say, actually, you know, I'd like to take this bit or that bit out. Um, I don't see any other questions just at the moment. Um, far, one, there are one that. or two, I think. Just, one has just come up from Bill Thomas. Is there any evidence from the physicians that they're they, that their reflections from oral history are having any impact or influence on the direction of travel for the NHS today? Yes, that's a good question again. Um, not really, and, and people have said a lot of things, um, and often the things that they say collaborate. So, and I think with the surgeons, some of the same um things will come across so um for example the dismantling of the firm system for example um in the light of um the changes from the the european union time directive working time directive um you know there's a lot of lamenting of the changing of that system or the internal market system is another thing that people talk about a lot um, and then there are researchers um, like Sally Sheard up in Liverpool who would make use of information of that kind that's collected, um, who do have more the ear of the politicians. Um, so she does a lot of oral history herself. Um, but we haven't actually been using the um, 
the physician's collection in that way at the moment. But of course, the, the nice thing about oral history is, like I was saying at the end, it, you're collecting it with the long view in a sense. Um, so, um, you know, if hopefully it might be used in that way in the future. I think the other thing is that you can't actually interview that many people, you know, because they're quite in depth, they're quite long. So you can never really claim to have a, a kind of representative sample of people that you've, you've interviewed. So that can sometimes be limited limiting for using the material in that way too. Thank you. A question here from David Mill. Are there any concerns regarding the resilience of digital, digital recording and the storage platform for these very valuable records in the long term? Um, yes, yeah, so like I said, there was, there was a big concern for the last 10 years about the analog collections and the slow deterioration of those formats and where the tape just begins to disintegrate and then the playback methods begin to disintegrate. I feel like digital recordings are going to be more resilient, actually, and we do do a lot of backing up. Um, and um, organisations that have big audio collections have a um, have systems where they have to review those sort of every five years or so to make sure they're keeping things in the best possible way. And um, the other nice thing, of course, about um, keeping a collection somewhere like the Royal College of Surgeons is that you have professional archivists who would be keeping an eye on, on that kind of thing. And the recordings would be on the main system, which means they'd be backed up regularly. So one thing that's a big concern, um, which is a concern of mine and other projects, is when they keep the recordings on um, an external hard drive, for example, and then the external hard drive can fail and you can lose all the recordings. But that wouldn't be an issue at the surgeons. OK, a uh, question from uh, George Naismith. Have you been able to collect sequential statements from your interviewees that show how various peer pressures may have prevented the interviewee from being as candid in an earlier interview as they have been in a later one? Yes. Um, I haven't done follow-up interviews. My experience with the physicians is that if somebody's retired, and certainly if, if somebody becomes very elderly, they're much more open <laughs> than people are if they're still working. So I think there's probably for this kind of project quite a lot of benefit of interviewing people after they've retired, actually, and just feel a little bit more free to speak. And um, the other thing, of course, is we can keep records closed for a certain number of years. So at the physicians, I'd say probably about 10 percent of the interviews are closed completely. Um, and then people feel that they can be very um, open um, because their material isn't going to, to come into the public domain for a set number of years. Um, but yes, follow-up interview is an interesting idea. The, the, the trouble is that oral history is very time consuming. Um, so in order to, to interview as many people as possible, if you kept going back, obviously that would, that would cut down on the number of people you could include in the collection. Um, no other questions at the moment. Uh, can I just um, emphasize one of the points you've made relating to the Royal College of Physicians, but we are introducing it hopefully uh, at the Royal College of Surgeons, and that is interviewees. Um, the, the oral history from interviewees can be appended uh, to obituaries in PLAS. So PLAS will have a written obituary and you'll be able to click on the oral history which has been given by that individual, um, which I think also uh, would prove to be a very, very important uh, addition uh, to the uh, concept of lives uh, of fellows of all college of surgeons. Um, yes, you, you'd probably want to talk more with Susan about that. Um, mm. But my understanding is that, that there certainly will be a facility to link through. Um, and certainly the physicians, one of the things we're doing, like I showed in the presentation, is, is attaching short clips as well um, into people's obituaries. So it's very nice, I think, to be able to hear somebody's voice as, as well as to read about them. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. I don't think there are any more questions to answer, but uh, your email is available and um, and Sarah has said she would answer any other particular points anybody wants to make or thinks about making later on. Well, 
Thanks for an incredibly absorbing talk. I think the whole project is particularly interesting. We've just uh, embarked upon a pilot. I think a total of six or maybe seven uh, interviews have taken place. Um, I should mention that um, should any senior fellow be interested in contributing to the project in either either um, as an interviewer or indeed as an interviewee, uh, perhaps I'd like to email in, me in confidence. And I think my email address will appear shortly um, on the screen. Um, I should mention that we have a, a small committee which uh, decides on both interviewers and interviewees. And in selecting, uh, we have adopted a series of criteria which take account not only our aspects of uh, diversity in, in ethnicity and gender, but also in geography, in surgical specialty, in age, type of hospital, whether DGH or a university. So anybody wishing to put their name forward, please do not be offended uh, if your interest uh, is, is actually not followed up. We have to limit it to particular key criteria. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. As I said, it's been great working with you on this project and uh, you provided a masterly account of oral history and uh, we're most grateful to you. Um, the final thing I would like to say is that I'd like to remind everyone about our next meeting, which is the London AGM, which takes place in the college on the 30th of November. Uh, the details and registration forms have been distributed and I think a, remainder, a reminder will be sent out shortly. And I do hope as many people as possible can join us on the 30th of uh, November for what I'm sure will be a both socially enjoyable and an educational uh, event. So thank you once again, Sarah, and thanks to everybody for listening in. As I say, the, this has been recorded, so you can look back on aspects uh, and uh, re-listen should you wish. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah, and good Thank evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye.